dad jokes, which I think steals some of the legitimacy. And when you buy col colored socks, they say, no, no, those are dad socks, which I don't fully understand other than in the end, it means that I'm OLD. So um, the theme uh, that we are considering in this four week um, visit that I have is from Psalm 107 and it's cry out, as you know, and uh, we're encouraging you to cry out in your distress and to take the challenge to cry out as God has met you in the past or is meeting you now to let people know. Psalm 107 introduces us to four groups of people, four separate challenges, one method of deliverance. Two weeks ago we considered the wanderers from verses 4 through 7, whoop, verses 4 through 9, and last week we looked at the prisoners from verses 10 through 16. This week we turn to the fools or rebels in verses 17 to 22. But before we actually look at that, I want to remind you what the first couple verses of Psalm 107 say. And they say, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. It's interesting, uh, that phrase, his love endures forever, has definitely been um, shifted a little bit from the original to uh, make it a little bit more understandable for us because what it really says is, uh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures, meaning, meaning um, it's not just going to continue, it always was. It, there's, there's no time bounds on God's goodness and love toward us. Imagining forever is difficult enough. It's, it's broad. It's without bounds. And then it says, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those who are redeemed from the hand of the foe. Those he gathered from the lands from east and west, from north and south. The time I've had with you here in Lombard has been special. Thank you. When I joined a fraternity in college, I thought I would be entering what was known as the Brotherhood of a Lifetime. And, you know, in some ways it is. It's maybe the definition of a fraternity. I joined that fraternity because I yearned for relationships, relationships of substance. You know what I'm talking about, right? We want significant relationships. We want real love. For the most part, and I want to be careful to qualify it, I was disappointed. I'm not saying I don't have good friendships from the fraternity, I do, but it wasn't all of what I hoped it would be, I think you might understand. When I trusted Christ for salvation, however, I entered into a life-changing personal relationship with the living God. I'm so much more glad to tell you about that than I am about my time in the fraternity. It's just the interesting thing was they intersected. <laughs> I know it's unusual. We don't say, oh, I hope that one day my kid will go to college and join a fraternity because that's probably how they'll meet Jesus. Probably not what happens in most cases, I know. And yet God is able to do anything. And not only did he give me a real relationship with himself, he gave me the family of God. And I'm so very thankful for that. I was kidding with a friend of mine, John, who's been here many Sundays, and uh, I said, how's everything going? And he's been traveling a little bit too, and he was looking forward to getting back to Chicago First Church of the Nazarene um, today. And I said, man, I've been gone long enough. I feel like I don't even know anybody anymore. And I said it as a joke, but I will tell you this. I have loved, loved, loved the time that I've been able to spend with you. So, Lord bless you. Right in the middle of this photo is my friend Brett. I grew up with Brett, and Brett was, uh, you know, lived just several blocks away from me, and we played baseball together, and Brett was always an all-star, and I never was. Um, he was taller, uh, stronger, more skilled, and just over a year ago, Brett had the Widowmaker heart attack. 
And if you're not fully aware of what that is, it was the kind of heart attack that you just don't make it. Um, there's very low probability of surviving. Um, but his wife had gone out to walk the dog. She came back. She found him in the fetal position. Um, she is a teacher, so she began CPR. She screamed for their son, who you see all the way over to the right, to call 911. And he did and ran and brought her the phone. And they, they over, the dispatch helped her count as she was understandably panicked. And you see a couple of the officers there that were first on the scene, and they took over CPR and also had a defibrillator with them. And when he was unresponsive, they brought him back. Brett um, was somebody who was leading a healthy lifestyle, and a non-smoker and a non-drinker and at the same time, he had a genetic predisposition to heart issues. It was through no fault of his own that he encountered this situation. I visited him in the hospital when I heard about that, the hospital not so very far away from me, and they had put him in a medically induced coma, and he had been out long enough, they didn't know how much brain damage there would be. And I went into the hospital, and his parents were there, and I knew him since you know, I was a kid, and everyone, I mean, it was more than a week he was in a medically induced coma, and they were trying to make it so that his heart could beat on its own, and I got a chance to go into the very dark hospital room and put my hand on him and pray for him. And uh, I'm not saying that there's a direct connection to that at all. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying don't pass the opportunity to pray for people. Um, but it wasn't very long after that, and they said they were going to try to take him out of the coma and, and see if his heart could do some of that and then find out what, what the damage was. And I'm, I'm here to let you know that probably for the last six months I've been working out um, at least three days a week with Brett at the gym and um, in, in almost every way that you can be he is fully recovered and we thank the Lord for that. I bring it up because our set of verses today is a different situation than Brett encountered um, but it's people in, in just as desperate of a situation it's just that, unlike Brett, the people that we're going to meet in this section of verses bring terrible circumstances on themselves. Look at what it says. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. And I want to break, about, break apart some of the things that we're looking at here today. First of all, rebellious ways. I want to say this. While my dad socks may not be the coolest thing ever, people really celebrate rebels, don't they? We like people who are different, people who won't walk the line, people who won't listen to the man, people who, we, we, we admire them, and that's the boldness, and uh, keep it going, and it doesn't matter if, if there's harm along the way. And unfortunately, unfortunately, and by the way, there are causes to be rebellious about. But unfortunately, what we're talking about here is not talking about admirable causes. Rebellious ways often result in foolish behavior. Foolish behavior can produce devastating consequences. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but we all know people who thought it would be cool to try something and then abused substances. We all know people who thought it would be okay to head in a certain direction and have suffered STTs. We know people who have had a self-absorbed a very self-centered mindset and have declared, well, you only live 
once as if it's some kind of trophy to head out in directions they know are wrong. The I'll try anything once mentality has not only produced a lot of regrets, people have experienced terrible devastation. Devastation that has not only affected them, but affected loved ones. And the scripture says, some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food. There wasn't even, there wasn't even anything that could keep them from drawing near the gates of death. I love the next set of verses. And by the way, we're in a place where we thank God that there are a next set of verses because a lot of people are living in desperate situations without hope. And today, we're here to declare hope in the living God. It says, Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, even those who, who had performed, the, who had behaved in the worst possible ways, have an opportunity to cry out to the Lord. That's a God who's long-suffering. And he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. I was talking about this scripture with a friend of mine, Dave Everson, and he said, cool. It's like God has an operation called Rescue 107. Plug the number of the psalm right into the rescue, Rescue 107. He sent his word and he healed, he rescued. We all need a rescue 107. I like this about sending out his word, and I'm going to read for you something from Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew chapter 8, it's just a sequence of verses. I'm not going to read them all, but my, it, it just demonstrates how God heals and heals. And, and by the way, do you believe today that God heals? I know God heals. God is not a wishing well for healing. That's the difference. I hope you understand. Matthew 8, verse 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him. That's, that's a Roman soldier occupying Jerusalem. He came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Now, we don't know what that means. We don't know how it was brought on, but he's paralyzed and he's in, in horrible suffering. Jesus said to him, Shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Don't you want to be somebody who believes God sometime in a way that amazes God? I do. I mean, this guy comes, and he goes, listen, uh, there's no need to come to my house. You're super busy as the Messiah, and all you got to do is say the word, and, and it's going to take care of matters. That's all I would need. That's all I'm looking for. And Jesus went, wow. That's the way I want to believe God, in a way that amazes him. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. It goes on in this passage, I'm skipping through a few verses, uh, when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she got up and began to wait on him. <laughs> Don't you love the situation? He just puts his hand in her hand, boom, she's healed, and she goes, can I get you something to eat? You know what, let me, let me clean your sandals for you. Uh, When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him. We don't know how they got demon-possessed. Some of them maybe opened up 
themselves spiritually in ways that were foolish. I, I, I don't know. And he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. That's our God. It's not too difficult. It's not going to take long. The last section of verses here that we're looking at says, Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds. You remember the story about the ten lepers and Jesus is walking by. He's got things to do and places to go. And the lepers, they're in a colony where they can't be near anyone because it's super contagious and communicable. And, and, and so they see someone going by who, who represents even just a sliver of hope. And they, they cry out to him. That's what they do. And he healed them all. This is um, a representation of what happened afterward. That's not exactly what Jesus looked like, I know. We don't know what the leper looked like, I know, but I like the photo nonetheless because one of those ten went, <laughs> i got to go back and thank him. I love, I love the... I mean, aren't we looking for this kind of tenderness? Aren't we looking for this kind of love? And he comes back. I'm sure he didn't have a prepared speech. I'm sure he just wanted to say thank you. In our prayers, in our praise, God's not looking for something that's super spectacular. If you find something that, that resonates with you, go ahead and read it to him or go ahead and write it down. I mean, that's great too. But this guy came giving thanks, and just threw himself on Jesus. I think about John. He was just so glad to be a disciple. He'd lay his head in Jesus' lap. And he knew enough about his acceptance with Jesus to write the disciple that Jesus loved. I mean, that became his identity. I, I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. You do know this morning that you are the one that Jesus loves, don't you? You do know that this morning. You are the one that Jesus loves. Please don't leave from here thinking anything differently. I know we've made mistakes. I know people have seen us at our worst. And that doesn't change the fact that you are the one that Jesus loves. My love for you, that wavers a little bit based on my mood and your behavior and other bad things. But Jesus loves you. Make no mistake. Let them sacrifice thank offerings. I love what happened to Peter's mother-in-law. She was like, I'm going to feed that man. <laughs> I'm going to be hospitable to that man. The healed leper came back and just loved on Jesus. Many who lead ministries today are leading ministries because Jesus rescued them and they're like, I got to let people know. I want to be on the front line to let people know that Jesus rescues people. And the last thing it says here, it says, in tell of his works with songs of joy. Um, and Bethany, I don't know if you remember this, but when we lived in Lombard, we had neighbors across the street, Dick and Sonia an older couple, and he was a little grouchy. She was as sweet as could be. You know a lot of couples like that, don't you? Um, and, uh, but he was, they were believers, and we connected with them, and um, I went over to have the family meet him once, and, and I had my Bible with me to invite people to, to church or Bible study, and I, I remember I, I knocked on the door, and I had my Bible, and he opened the door, and he goes, okay, I see you have your sword with you. 
And right away I knew he was a believer, and I knew he was probably a little edgy. And I liked it. And, and while we didn't become great friends, we became good neighbors. And by and by, a couple of years passed, and uh, Dick began to ail. And his health began to fail. And we knew that, and it, it would check up on them from time to time, and he had some broken relationships in his own family, which made my heart just as sad as could be. And Sonia saw us one day and said, you know, he's, he's now on hospice, and I don't think he has very long. And they did an in-home care. And um, so our family went over there, and, you know, what can you do with somebody who's in hospice other than maybe tell them you're praying for them? And if you know them well enough, tell them that you love them. And, Bethany, I don't know if you remember what happened, but our family knew a few songs. We, we knew some choruses, and we had been used to singing, um, you know, choruses. I could start singing some of them now, but I'd like you to stay. So, um we, we began singing some choruses, some were old-time choruses and hymns, and Dick was really not there, you know what I mean? He had not communicated in a week, two weeks, I, I don't remember the time, but as we sang, Dick's eyes opened, and he started to try to sing with us as he recognized the songs. And then he began to sing well with us. And I remember looking over at Sonia, who hadn't seen her husband communicate for, I can't remember how long it was. And just be, and listen, even our singing ministers to people. You know most people have never heard someone pray. Most people have never heard anybody sing something that really ministers. We have lots of opportunity to sing songs of joy and tell stories in that kind of a way. And I want to encourage you to take advantage of that. As we wrap today, I want to remind you that whether you have in your life experienced wandering or feeling imprisoned by circumstances and behaviors, or if you've covered enough ground to go way off the reservation in ways that are rebellious and foolish, Whatever the circumstances are, different though they may be, there is one method of deliverance. Salvation is found in no one else. It's Jesus. We want to remind you, you have opportunity as we close today. And Beth, I'm going to have you come if you don't mind. We have opportunity to cry out to him. And maybe, maybe you're someone who did cry out in the past and you've just, you've, headed in the wrong direction. Today is a day to be right, to make things right with God. He, he's ready. And maybe you've never, you've never trusted Christ for salvation. I want to tell you, today is that day. Today is the day to do it. And I'll be here and I'd be glad to pray with you uh, for whatever reason. And today, if you've been rescued, I want to encourage you to tell someone. Come and tell me. Tell, tell my daughter. Teresa's here. Teresa, I don't want you bombarded. Uh, but, but Teresa's here. You could tell Teresa. I don't know why we don't share our stories. Let's share our stories. It's really his story, isn't he? Isn't it? He, he's writing a, a great story in our lives. Tell someone. If you're not going to tell somebody here, that's fine. But tell somebody. And I want to challenge you to thank him. Surely something's going to come to mind this morning that you can thank God for. Maybe as you begin to think about the list, it's endless. And finally, 
like Peter's mother-in-law, like the leper, who could have been doing anything and yet came back to thank Jesus. I want to encourage you to serve him. Let your life cry out in service to him. So um, I invite you now to depart in peace. As mentioned, I, I also want to challenge you. Feel free to come on up here. There will be others that would be willing to pray with you as well. Hear your story. Hear how God has worked in your lives. May the Lord richly bless you. Amen.